Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry and uh, my guest today is Dr. Michael Haken. Uh, he is a husband and a father. He's a church history scholar, uh, Christian spirituality. Uh, he's a prolific author and speaker and uh, one of my favorite seminary professors as well. So uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Haken. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, just kind of flesh out, you know, maybe your mm -hmm. journey into ministry and, and uh, where you're from and everything else. Yeah, so I'm born, I was born in England and um, uh, Irish mother, Catholic, and my father was uh, Kurdish, uh, is Kurdish, uh, Muslim background. Um, I never knew he was a Muslim until I was in my 20s. Oh, wow. Because one of the requirements of his marrying my mother, uh, levied by my grandfather, uh, was that he become a Catholic. So I was raised Roman Catholic. Um, my father really embraced my mother's culture. Um, mm -hmm. If you met my dad, he's got a pure English accent, so he sounds English. Um, he would have moved to England when he was in his mid to late teens. And so you would think he would have an accent, but he doesn't. And uh, he's able to to basically uh, embrace my my mother's culture, English culture more maybe than the Irish. Mm -hmm. um, so I was raised in a in a wasn't a kind of a mixed cultural background. It was very much my mother's Irish Catholic culture. We uh, moved to Canada when I was twelve. My father got a teaching post at a Baptist school called McMaster University. They had um, all through the They'd been founded in the in late 1880s and uh, all through the pretty well most of the 20th century up until the 1950s, uh, they were a Baptist school owned by the Baptist denomination in Ontario, the old Baptist Convention of Ontario and Quebec, and then became a, um, the Baptists retained a small divinity college and the McMaster University became a, a private chartered um university uh, not denominationally owned okay um the um uh early years uh in canada were difficult ones for me uh culture shock um i didn't like being in canada uh and those were those were also years of the late 60s kind of rebellion and i think i expressed some of my inner turmoil through embracing uh, the kind of cultural perspective of the uh, the left uh, mm -hmm. in many ways politically. I was a Marxist by the oh. time I was 16. Um, how deep that Marxism could be, yeah, you know, I leave it to you or others to try to figure out. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I read people like Che Guevara, Mao Zedong, uh, etc. Um, committed very much to kind of the sort of program of uh, the SDS, Students for Democratic Society, the Weathermen, uh, the violent, the kind of violent wing of the SDS, uh, Black Panthers, mm. uh, that sort of, that was in my mind, that's where I identified. Mm. Um, went to university at a place called the University of Western Ontario for a year, and that was a, a, a very important event, the very, a very important event took place there. Um, I remember, um, I was studying philosophy and sitting down to write a philosophical proof for the existence or non-existence for God. And I, I had this overwhelming realization that God existed. Mm. Wow. And it wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant experience because I remember being terrified and actually getting up. I was, I was, I was boarding with an elderly couple and getting up and running out of the house and doing, going for a long walk because it just terrified me. The idea that God existed. Mm. I don't think I would have denied God before then, even though I was a Marxist. Um, I hadn't thought that issue through, but I just I knew that there was a God, um, that he was mm. uh, independent of any sort of uh, philosophical proof that I could uh, write out. Um, the following year, I moved to Toronto, the University of Toronto, which is where I would stay, get my BA, my M Master of Divinity, and then my PhD. In my final year, my BA was converted. Um, I had started working in the summer of 73 at a pizza parlor in Hamilton, Ontario, mm -hmm. which is not far from where I live, uh, which is at the, the, uh, the end of, uh, or the head of Lake Ontario, before you turn down to the Niagara Peninsula, to Niagara Falls. 
And I had met a Christian in the pizza parlor, a young woman who I took an interest in and who eventually became my wife. And I found out she was a Baptist. And um, it wasn't so much of being a Baptist, but being a Christian. I, I asked her if I could go to church with her. I really felt I had to clean up my life. I was thinking like a Catholic, you know, you go to church, do a few of the externals and everything's fine. But yeah, um, I was a theist. Um, my Marxism had pretty well been shed, except for maybe some of some elements. But I'd been very interested in existentialism, uh, particularly the existentialism of Martin Heidegger. <clears throat> and um, but I was converted. I it was quite a a radical change for me to go to a, a church where it was nothing at all like the Roman Catholic Church of my mm. upbringing. And it was there that I heard the gospel and responded to it. And um, in the spring of 74, realized that God was calling me to um, vocational ministry. And um, my pastor very wisely had me enroll at a school called Wycliffe College, which is a Anglican, evangelical Anglican school. In those days, it had some really remarkable theologians uh, and mm -hmm. scholars. R.K. Harrison, who was one of the leading Old Testament scholars, um, Richard Longnecker, New Testament scholar, Oliver O'Donovan, systematic theologian, just really remarkable scholars. I, I entered when I was 20. I had no idea the men that I was studying under, really, in terms of just the privilege of, mm -hmm. of the, that education. And I was there for eight years. Um, Within a year, I realized God was calling me to academia, not pastoral ministry or mission field, so-called, and um, stayed on and got a PhD in patristics and first began teaching at a school called Central Baptist Seminary in Toronto. Um, early 1990s, that merged with another school, London Baptist Bible Culture and Seminary, London, Ontario, that is to become Heritage Seminary in Cambridge, Ontario. And I was there till around 2000. And then for a few years was involved in a publishing house as a director, editorial director. And then in 2002 became the um, adjunct at Southern and full-time in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been at Southern ever since as a full-time um, professor of church history and uh, in more recent years, also the chair of the history department. Yeah. Yeah, no, wonderful. That's where our, our cro paths crossed yeah. back in 2014. Yeah. Um, tell us, I, mean, I, I always appreciated history. And I, I realized I was a history guy, for lack of a better word, um, in my first class with you, my first class in, in seminary. Um, I had taken a lot of art history I always appreciated U.S. history, wars, talking about this, just different events happening. And a lot of people just see history as, you know, as dead people. It's just dead people, it's this and that. You got, you know, the little dash between the two dates, that whole kind of rhetoric. Why is church history, just history in general, so vital to the Christian? Um, and, and I mean, just anybody, but in particular to the believer. Why should we care so much about history and church history in particular? Mm -hmm. Well, I think for the Christian, let me just take, and then I'll broaden it maybe. Um, for the Christian, uh, history is important because God, God deems it absolutely vital. You know, if you take the Bible as the revelation of, of our God and his word to humanity, um, <clears throat> so much of it is history, running mm -hmm. from Genesis all the way through to uh, Second Chronicles. That's all history. Um, then you have what we call the wisdom literature, you know, the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. And granted, you know, the Psalter has some of those Psalms have very clear, definite historical context, but the Proverbs definitely not. But then you get the latter, really the last half of the Bible, the New Old Testament is again, the prophets. And they're, they're against the backdrop of, of the history of Israel and Judah. And so uh, history is vital to the Old Testament. God calls Abraham in history, makes a covenant with him. Moses is called the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, uh, the foretelling of the future Messiah. Uh, Israel being formed as a kingdom, being the womb, as it were, the matrix through in which the Messiah would come. And then uh, the savior of the world, uh, our Lord Jesus, coming into history 
uh, taking on humanity and uh, living in history at a specific time under Augustus Caesar and then Tiberius Caesar being crucified under Pontius Pilate. That's part of our confession of faith. Yeah. He suffered and was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Um, and it, you, when you reflect on the fact that, you know, this is really weird. I'm, I'm making a statement of my beliefs as a Christian, and there's, there's this pagan Roman governor in there. Like, what, what's Pontius Pilate doing in the text? Yeah. Well, like, he's in the text because it, it adds specificity. It adds historicity to the Christian faith. And um, Christ is raised in space and time. Mm -hmm. You know, the argument that Rudolf Bultmann made, you know, if, if tomorrow we found he was a liberal German theologian, if tomorrow we found the bones of Jesus in, and we could approve it was the bones of Jesus in the Judean desert or in Jerusalem, it wouldn't make any difference to the Christian faith. Well, of course it would. It would destroy the Christian faith um, because uh, we, we confess that Christ Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate and was raised on the third day, flesh and blood. Uh, yes, transformed, but genuinely his body was no longer in the tomb. Mm -hmm. And so the Christian faith then is rooted and grounded in its salvific events and the events that we talk about, the saving events of, of God's great acts in history, um, in, in history. Uh, Judaism the same. Um, obviously, Judaism rejects the claims of the Messiah, but uh, they too are rooted in history. The, the call of Abraham, the Exodus, the covenant, the prophets. Mm -hmm. um, other religions, you know, like Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and definitely Buddhism and Hinduism, they're, 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 they're a flight from history. History doesn't matter a whit, really. Their, their goal is to escape history. Yeah. And we confess, no, no, history is absolutely vital. So that's one reason. Uh, that's a very Christian reason. You can't understand who you are if you don't have a knowledge of history. Um, history is the, the fabric of our culture, our society. And uh, like it or not, you can't escape that. Mm -hmm. uh, even when you think you're, 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 you are escaping it, invariably you're repeating various things that are just simply there unconsciously or subconsciously. Um, it's like your genetic code. You know, I, I didn't choose to be born um, with a Middle Eastern father. So, you know, I'm uh, half uh, European, half Middle Eastern. Um, I didn't choose to have brown eyes or black hair when I was much younger. It's not that way now. Uh, or my height, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't choose any of that. Yeah. But those were chosen for me. They're written <clears throat> into my genetic code. And to understand who I am, I have to take stock of, of my, my past. Um, my father made decisions for me that have radically shaped my life. He made a decision when I was one years old uh, to stay in Britain and not go back to Iraq, which he had intended to do all along. He never went back to mm. Iraq. He left in 1949, 1950. Uh, he's still living. Um, he's, he never went back. Wow. Well, that was, a, I mean, if he had gone back, how different my life would have been raised in a Muslim culture, uh, having gone through the, the Gulf Wars, the, the rise of ISIS, the Iraqi Ram War. I had, I had relatives fight in the Iraqi Ram War. Wow. Uh, I have relatives in the Peshmerga who fought against Saddam Hussein. Um, and then a mother whose grandfather was in the IRA um, and um, really prized their Irish heritage. Uh, my mother won a major prize for, for Gaelic literature. Wow. And these things were passed on to me. I, I didn't choose any of that. And you've got the same story. Everybody listening, we've, we've, got, we've got all kinds of stories. We don't choose them. They shape us. Yeah. And I, 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 don't, I don't come into this world as clean slate and I can reinvent myself and create some sort of persona for myself. If I do, I'm living a lie. Mm. Because there is, this, there is this environment, this background. Now, this is not the sum of who I am. Of course, I have freedom of will, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, freedom of will in the sense of human responsibility. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get technical theologically there. Yeah. Um, but I can't understand who I am if I don't take stock of my past. And the same with the church. I, I, that was an extended analogy there. But the church, the church has no idea who she is if she doesn't understand her past. And there are things back there that are disturbing. Um, you know, the church, the church 
you know, to, to launch, I don't want to get into a, you know, a, a big, big issue here, but here in Canada, evangelicals have not done well reaching our native people, the indigenous people. Mm. And part of that was because for, for many uh, 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 evangelicals in, in the 19th century here in Ontario, for example, they, they, they had an, an attitude of uh, superiority to the indigenous people. And they couldn't approach them on, a, on, the, on the same level. They, they approached them with the idea, your culture is the pits and you need to embrace our culture to be a Christian. Yeah. And um, wow. that has shaped us. I mean, w- one of the big problems we have as Canadian evangelicals is how can, how can we speak the gospel to our indigenous people? And um, we're, we've got problems because of the way we have dealt with this in the past and you 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 can't just ignore that um the blessings we have the fact that we have gospel preaching churches the fact that when i was uh 20 years old i could walk into stanley avenue baptist church in hamilton ontario founded as a sunday school mission in the 1870s a hundred years before i ever walked into that church and there was a place where where there was a gospel preaching um (laughs) The fact that in the 1920s, when there was a huge battle over liberal theology, there were men and women in that church who stood against the drift into liberal theology. So that 40 years later, 50 years later, somebody like me, a young, just teenager, I was a teenager actually, uh, late teens, could walk into Stanley Avenue Baptist Church and hear the gospel. Mm. Well, I I didn't lay those foundations. And um, so... We are, we are the heirs of both good and bad in our past as Christians. And we, we need to know, we need to know where we've come from. Yeah. And uh, thankfully, um, I mean, the, one of the big battles today, especially in the States, but it's, it's also here and, and throughout the Western world is, is over history. How do we, how do we remember the past? You know, the whole brouhaha last year about pulling down statues. And we, we had a few pulled down here. Uh, that, that's got to do, how do we remember the past? How do we remember these people? Uh, who, do, who do we honor? Yeah. And why, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that's got to do with trying to figure out what does the past mean and how does it affect us now and et cetera. So in, in one sense, although the, 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 those experiences last summer were, were difficult, but they, 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 they have a, a salutary element if they force us to think, okay, how should we remember the past? Simply pulling down a statue, you know, that's, that may or may not be helpful, but it raises questions. Why, why, is the, why is that statue problematic? Because it represents this strain of history. Okay, then how do we deal with this strain of history? How do we think about it? Yeah, no, that's good. That's definitely, I think, I mean, we see this, we've seen this a lot with, you know, complete communist takeovers in, in other places of the world mm-hmm. in the last hundred or so years. And they erase history. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's the one thing. If you want to have a compliant, flexible, pliable people, you need to have people that are not attached to much yep. of anything. Yep. You know, I mean, I have a wife and children, right? You have a wife and children. We have jobs. We have heritage. I'm not just going to pick up and move or go serve wherever or go just do some random thing without deep consideration for my wife and so you know and that goes well i have parents and i've got sister and and other things and we're tied but if you have a you know basically tyrants and generally they come in communist form all of fascism too but they want to control and why they want to control right power and corruption and all that but if they want to have people malleable and not attached they have to well you didn't really come from here or that's bad and you you know demean people and yeah it's 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 crazy (laughs) well yeah i mean during during for instance you know i was a i was a marxist and actually pretty committed to mal and i what i didn't realize and i'm sure this would eventually have gotten you know this would have been a major issue for me because i've always loved history but Mm. during the 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 heart of the maoist years during the 60s i mean he systematically destroyed chinese heritage yeah so anything that spoke of the Confucian past, um, th- those things, those things were destroyed. Buildings were leveled, historic buildings were leveled, books were destroyed. 
wow. exactly as you're saying, so that he would remove any possibility of you remembering that past. Um, wow. I mean, one of the reasons why I was a Trotskyite and not a Stalinist, I wasn't a communist. I would never have called myself a communist because I, Stalin did the very thing that you're talking about again. He canceled people. So you, you've got these pictures of Stalin, for instance, with some of the uh, key uh, leaders like Zinoviev and Trotsky in the 20s. And then the picture is doctored 40 years later. Zinoviev is nowhere to be seen because yeah. they, they got rid of him in a gulag. And Trotsky uh, was exiled and murdered by Stalin's agents in uh, Mexico. And you take these people out of the pictures as if they never existed. And uh, you're right. Um, the, 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 the way in which you, you destroy um, uh, or you, you render a people malleable is to destroy their heritage, destroy mm -hmm. their past. Yeah. And um, so there are numerous reasons why we, it is vital for us to remember the past and also to recognize the way we as human beings mm -hmm. subjectively reinterpret the past sometimes reinterpret the past. So what biases do I bring as a Christian? You know, I'm a North American Christian who's got various uh, life experiences. Uh, that shapes the way I read the past. So I have to be self-conscious. And um, so history is, uh, history is, a, is not only a fascinating field of study, but it's also a very helpful field in developing certain virtues. Mm -hmm um humility um empathy uh or sympathy um so i i'm 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 a big believer that history even if even if a person is not going to become a historian they need they need to have a regular dose of history uh i think in our educational system here in ontario you can get through four years of high school with uh one year of history uh, it's bizarre to me absolutely wow. bizarre to me yeah um, yeah no that's a good point As, that's not that's, true elsewhere i i know i've been in texas and have mentioned that and i'm always reminded by texans well no no you can't do that here uh <laughs> they get four years and usually if i don't know if it's four years of texas history i can't believe that but they yeah, certainly yeah. get a good dose of texas history and other history and i, I think it's, it's important i mean you know you as an american i'm as canadian um, we we need to know the history of our, our nations yeah how can you be a good citizen if you don't know what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be a Canadian? Mm -hmm. um, and also then the history, the longer history of Western culture. And that, now that's a big explosive subject today, you know, uh, because Western culture is interpreted by some as simply a long history of racism, which is again, a complete, it's completely fallacious. It's simplistic. It fails to take in the complexity of, of the past. But, uh, you know, I, I, because of, my dad, dad's decision, I was raised in the West. I'm not a Westerner. And to understand Western culture, to understand <clears throat> Canadian culture, I need to know the history of Britain, Greek and Greece and Roman history. And really, you know, and here I'm, you know, um, uh, you, you really need to know the history of Christianity. Mm -hmm. if you, even if you're not a Christian, if you want to understand where we are in terms of American history in the early 21st century, you need to know the history of Christianity because Christianity has so shaped our culture. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, you gave, I remember in class, I think I had you on three or four different times and wonderful stories you'd often tell uh, about, you know, XYZ person and, you know, whether it was America or, or somewhere in Europe. Um, what are some church um history moments i've got one uh, but i'll let you go first that you know we've seen some persecution in canada right churches being arrested and pastors being arrested and other churches and pastors kind of just completely bowing to the state now there's kind of somewhere in the middle and even you know we can go even more extreme and look at the the official church of china and other churches they blow up with literal dynamite you know in church buildings and Cambodia and Malaysia and, and, and you name it. There's lots and lots of persecution. And I run into people so often um, and they're just kind of, you know, scrolling almost waiting for the Antichrist to show up, you know, looking at their news feed or whatever. And it's just this kind of, it's coming, you know, and, and, 
I've, I've greatly distanced myself for lots of reasons in kind of having that view as I used to have. It's very, it's very prolific in, uh, wet on the, um, in California, Western, Western United States, uh, pre-millennial dispensational rapture, that whole thing. And, you know, good, bad, or otherwise, we could disagree about that. I know you don't hold to that either, but there's just a certain like, oh, once, if my pastor goes to jail, the shoe's dropping and then it's all over. And it's like, anyway, what are some great instances that we can look at and take uh, solace in and look at history and say, persecution does this, there's flourishing and there's diminishing and there's this and there's that, there's tyranny and there's, and blessing give us, give us some, uh, give us some hope from church history. Well, I think, I think, uh, I think we have to take uh, our Lord's words in John, the gospel of John seriously. Um, you know, if they've hated me, they will hate you. Mm. And um, so what should surprise us, but it always does, but what should surprise us um, is not persecution, though, though it does always surprise Christians. What should surprise us is if we live without persecution. Yeah. If you look at the New Testament, um, you know, you think of Philippians. Um, it has been given to you to believe, not only to believe, but to suffer for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1. Um, or 2 Timothy 3. Um, anyone who desires to walk godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And in the, in the New Testament, you've got a range. You've got a range from the sort of violence you see against Stephen uh, to the sort of things that you see in uh, First Peter or Hebrews, where Christians have been excluded from uh, the synagogue, or mm -hmm. they've been excluded from certain public venues, or they've had names. They've been called names. Uh, so ostracism and name calling. Um, maybe they've lost jobs. And so... Um, Persecution then is, is a norm of, of, it's understood to be a norm of, 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 Christ, of the Christian life. Uh, you don't have to go searching for it. If you live faithfully as a believer, you will encounter it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the testimony of all of God's people, those who are genuine, will, will, will bear witness to that. And it may have been, from one point of view, it may have been as um, mild as simply being called names or, you know, C.S. Lewis, for example, during his tenure as a professor, and he wasn't a professor, he was a reader at Oxford University. He never was elected professor. Mm. Uh, the British system of universities is one in which there's only one professor in a department. Everybody else is a lecturer, tutor, reader, and I think he was a tutor. And he didn't become a professor until the end of his life when he moved from Oxford University to Cambridge. And what blocked him in the English department at Oxford was the fact that people mocked him as a Christian. Wow. Uh, one of the historians who's a he's a Marxist historian named Christopher Hill, who I, I've read a lot of Hill. He's a he's a good historian in terms of the sort of questions he asks about the Puritan era in England and the English Civil War. But he was particularly vicious against uh, against Lewis and new faculty. He would warn them. He said, if you ever get invited and you're at dinner with Lewis, watch out because he'll 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 buttonhole you and try to convince you to become a Christian. <laughs> and uh Lewis, that was never lewis's style never lewis's style uh, lewis lewis was uh forthright in his convictions but he wasn't going to em embarrass you or buttonhole you or do that sort of thing and this sort of uh thing he had to endure that for the best part of probably 30 years wow and he got passed over again and again and again for the professorship he should have been the professor of of the english department he was by, by and far the most prolific author, mm. but especially um, even more when he began writing children's stories and began writing books on Christianity. I mean, the faculty thought he'd gone off his head. <laughs> and wow. uh, so persecution comes in different ways. But if you're faithful as a believer, it'll be there. Yeah. Uh, family, friends, neighborhoods, job. And then, again, depending upon the culture, and where we've had the privilege of living in a culture shaped by Christianity and by the gospel, uh, so that to be a Christian, yeah, you may experience uh, people name calling and ostracism like Lewis did, etc. But it's not going to erupt in violence. Um, again, uh, there are qualifications here. 
you know, obviously in the United States during the 20s and 30s, you, you did have, you know, lynchings and so on. Uh, th those are often race-based, but they were against believers, you know, our African brother, American brothers and sisters. But we've, we've had a, to be, to be somebody who is white or European background in American culture, up until the present day, generally speaking, you, you, you don't have to fear violence against your person as a Christian. But that could change. Yeah. But that doesn't mean, surely that doesn't mean, you know, we haven't had violence against Christians in America, for instance. You have to go back until the 1750s when Baptist ministers in uh, Virginia were physically attacked or the 1650s when Quakers and, and Baptists in New England were whipped on mm. Boston Common, I, you know, Obadiah Home, 1651. But surely in those last 250 years, there's been persecution. I mean, don't tell me there hasn't been. Yeah, it, uh, it, in the eyes of the New Testament, if there hasn't been, we've not had faithful Christianity. Yeah, that's true. So, um, but there are many, yeah, I, you know, you've, you've got a, a many, I, 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 for me, Lewis is a very helpful example for our current context of how to deal, how to deal with that, 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 that the pettiness, the sniping, the name calling, the ostracism. Yeah. Um, and then obviously there are more, more extreme examples where there is violence against our person and, you know, Nazi Germany. Uh, I've, I've read a lot about Bonhoeffer, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was martyred, and uh, James Helmut von Molk, who was martyred, um, and other Christians who were executed um, uh, for, their, for their faith during that period of time. And so um, there is um, what persecution does, uh, whatever form it takes, is it reminds you that this is not our home. Mm -hmm. That we are, we're, especially when you're in a culture, you know, that's your culture fits us like a glove. You know, I'm a Canadian, you're American, and you're at home in this cult, your culture. It fits you mm -hmm. like a glove, but then persecution reminds you, no. No, you're 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 a pilgrim. This is yeah. not your final home. Yeah, and this is the world, and there is a sense in which the world lies under the control of the devil. This is Babylon, and again, don't push those images too far, because obviously God controls the entirety of the world. I'm a Calvinist. I believe in the sovereignty of God over all all of existence, but. Um, the New Testament looks at things from a variety of angles. And from one angle, uh, the world is, is the devil's. Mm -hmm. And we, we, if we do feel completely at home, there's something wrong with us. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, be in the world, but not of the world, right? Yeah. You know, making friends with the world. And so persecution, then, is a, is a helpful reminder to us that we are called to be different. Yeah. And uh, we have a, the church is to form her own culture. And that culture is to be one of winsomeness and love and attractiveness to, to outsiders. Um, and yet also truth speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you repent, you will also perish. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's something that I think sometimes we see. And, it, you know, again, eschatology does play into it, I think, a lot more than some people realize. Because um, you have certain levels and we even see with immigrants and other things why we have i mean correct me if i'm wrong but you know why you have chinatown or german little germany or little italy or this in you know, german town in louisville for example you know there's areas that a lot of times people came there immigrated there and either because of you know oppression or persecution or just well i speak italian they speak English, I'm an, but these guys speak Italian. I'm going to go hang out with them. These are my cousins, et cetera. We kind of self-segregate and kind of build our own cultures that way. And I feel like Christians, we can, we have done that in the past. And I think sometimes we need to either try and do that now to a degree, not to, you know, holy huddle, stay away, but at least be aware, hey, if you do get passed over, like C.S. Lewis did a bunch of times, for the promotion or you don't get the job yeah that is persecution but you don't need to freak out about it you'll still get a job the lord will still provide and 
maybe go do something different that you weren't planning on doing. I think that can be helpful and not be so soaked in the culture, but being more communal. And I think we are seeing that. I mean, a lot of people, I know a lot of people have left places like California, for example, because it's just, you know, so oppressive in a lot of different ways and high taxes and just ridiculous politics. And, you know, there's still faithful churches and faithful Christians, but, you know, there's a level of like, hey, there's these people here, they're building something, they're working on a classical school, let's go help them. They're planting churches, let's go do that. Let's go, oh, he started a business, I want to work for him, and, and, and so on. Um, there were two instances, one um, that I just, I just love was the, and I, you told me his name, and I can't remember it now, but where the man was preaching, and there's a curtain up, this is in England, right? Um, and I, I, I remember it was side. Yeah, it's, like, it's Andrew Gifford. Gifford. Senior. That's right, Gifford. Yeah. And Andrew he was Gifford. preaching, and there's a curtain because there's spies in the congregation. If they saw him, he'd be arrested, yep. and this and that. And they tackle him one instance, and there's a trap door that had been set up, and he scurries out of the trap door and then sneaks back into the town the next week dressed as an old lady and Correct. preaches again. Yeah, that's Gifford. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just stuff like that it's like if somebody were to do that today for most pastors most preachers i feel like they would just you know shrivel up and die and feel oh woe is me my life is so hard and this guy dresses up like an old lady and goes and does it again it's just that's one dedication that's just so wonderful um another one and it's a little more foggy in my mind and i think it was you told us it was a stool and the bible was taped onto the bottom of the stool is this is this a story that you told in class and I, basically he would read it and if somebody would come they would flip the stool back over and then like you know some government official or some constable or whatever would show up and oh yeah no there's no, no bible here we're just we're just hanging out and doing whatever did you did you tell that story? no i don't recall that account I, where I heard that um, then. it, it sounds Anyways. familiar to me um, yeah but that's not something i've ever used i don't think and I'm pretty sure it was, again, in, in the English speaking world, you know, where there was, they, they taped, it was illegal to have a Bible, right? Or a Bible in your possession, that is. And, you know, they were reading it though. And well, that would only have been in the period between 1407 and uh, the early 1500s when it was illegal to have a copy of the English Bible. Okay. So it might well have been the Lollards. And that I think might it have is. been, yeah, that, that might have been right. a, an account that I, I might have said something about the Lollards. Yeah. Um, but the Andrew Gifford story is great. I mean, Gifford was an intrepid evangelist. Yeah. And again, it's it's a shame that, you know, in some of these men's lives, um, I'm not sure we have enough detail to write a biography, but there there should be uh, some sort of account of him mm. um, because he was just a remarkable preacher um, and uh, would have been known to Bunyan, John Bunyan, uh, of much greater fame. Um, but he did, he did end up spending some time in prison, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, he's a uh, he's a. He, I I have a fascination with Andrew Gifford and would love to see somebody write a, a biography of him. Yeah, um, yeah, no, those are those are helpful. I I didn't know that about Lewis. I figured something was up with him not ever reaching the highest um, position. Yeah, he, he didn't at Oxford. Eventually, you know, Cambridge offered him a the, the professorship of the English department, and that's when he moved to Cambridge. Mm, that's right. um, but it really is. It reveals again, as I say, that that important truth that um, even in Christian cultures, so-called um, faithful living for Christ will have its own cost. And um, I mean, Paul gives it as a general principle: all 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 who desire to walk godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Yeah, you don't you don't have to go searching for it. In fact, the early church in the first four centuries will distinguish between martyrdom according to the gospel and self-sought martyrdom. Mm. And it's hard to believe this, but there were, there were people who actually taunted the Roman soldiers to, to martyr them. Wow. Uh, they're not common, but there were examples. And the, the early church argued, no, there is, there is a martyrdom according to the gospel, um, which was one in which you don't need to go and seek persecution um, to live a faithful witness in Christ. It'll find you. Yeah and um so wow um no that's good thank you <clears throat> for your other avenue that you uh, study quite a bit and have a lot of experience in is christian spirituality uh now a lot of christians 
you know, good, bad, or otherwise, hear that and instantly think, this guy's weird. This guy's new age. That's that's Looney Tunes. You know, bells and whistles are going off. Spirituality. I'm not spiritual. I, I'm I'm not religious. I, I just have a relationship with Jesus. You know that type of mentality. Can you flesh out a little bit when somebody looks at the Christian bookstore or online, and and they might think, well, okay, but Christian spirituality. What's the difference? What 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 do I need to know uh, to to have a better understanding? Yeah, spirituality is probably the the buzzword there that causes some angst among some Christians, partly because, actually mainly because spirituality has become such a grab all term. Mm. It's become a term that means everything from you know Christian spirituality, which is its proper sphere, all the way over to I, I mean I've seen books on atheistic spirituality, you know New Age spirituality, Buddhist spirituality, etc. Um, in the past, Christians have used different terms. The word spirituality is a, um, probably the first usage of it is a Latin term, spiritualitas. Um, and it's used in a book that was attributed to the, the early Christian author, Jerome, who's mm -hmm. famous for translating the Bible into Latin. Um, and uh, it's derived, it's a, it's a Christian term. It's derived from the word spiritus, which means spirit, Holy Spirit. And spiritualitas has got to do with the living uh, uh, out New Testament life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, during the Middle Ages, the word spirituality became used in a number of ways. One of the ways it got, became used was um, it became a, as an identifier of ordained clergy and monks and bishops and nuns. So they were called collectively the spirituality of the church hmm. and that that actually is very dangerous but it also it indicates that the church of the medieval period had come to this idea there are two different ways to live the christian life you can live it as a husband wife uh homemaker you know whatever your vocation um and or you can or you can be serious about living the christian life and become ordained as a priest or become a monk or a nun. Mm -hmm. And they are the spirituality of the church. They are the, they are the real spiritual ones. Wow. Everybody else is just kind of tagging along for the ride and hoping to get to heaven on the boot, on the bootstraps of these other people. Um, so it's not surprising that the reformers rarely use the term. Mm. They, they tend to use the term pietas, piety. Um, which again, over the, over the centuries between now and then the 1500s has become a bit of a negative term. Uh, spirituality starts to become more of a positive term in the 1700s through the Roman Catholic church, where Roman Catholic theologians began to talk about, especially French Catholic theologians, spirituality. And from there, it makes its way back into the English language, um, to describe the really describe say what the Puritans or the reformers would describe as pietas or piety or a godliness or spiritual disciplines. So we get to the situation that today in which you've, you've got a variety of terms that can be used and the word spirituality, I do use the word spirituality, um, but I'm very conscious that the term has a bit of a checkered past. The way it was used in the middle ages is problematic. Um, and the way that it's used so broadly today. Mm -hmm. um, and so normally what I do is if I'm in, in a context where I think that there might be some misunderstanding between about the term, I usually qualify it with a moniker like Christian spirituality or evangelical spirituality or much better than either in some ways, uh, biblical spirituality. Yeah. So what am, I, what am I in favor of? Well, I'm in favor of a spirituality that accords with what, we, we learn about in the new testament what does a spirit-filled life look like uh, what are the fruit of the spirit what does it mean to walk in the spirit uh pray in the spirit um think uh according to the spirit of god so that's spirituality and the disciplines associated with that reading the scriptures uh the preaching of the word the lord's table uh prayer um fellowship friendship uh etc yeah that's good. No, yeah, I think I think having distinctions and proper definitions of things is really, really vital to just, I mean, life, life in general, but 
especially when it comes to Christian church stuff that we get. Yep. You know, we were talking earlier and it was, we kind of have this allergy to certain things and we think, ah, ah, no, I can't do that. You know, I'm, I'm gluten intolerant. Oh, I can't have strawberries, you know, or whatever. And so we just don't even, we just don't even go there. We don't even look at it. And we don't, when it, there shouldn't be an aversion necessarily, or it might be an art, artificial aversion. Um, but no, that's, that's very helpful. Um, well, let's wrap up with resources. I know you've written a load of works over the years with the church fathers, of course, Baptist history. That was one, one of your, um, one of the classes I took with you. You're very broad, but also very focused in other areas as well. Andrew Fuller's another one in particular within Baptist history. Um, friends uh, with a lot of well-known names that many people may know about early modern missions. What are some books that people can pick up, uh, you know, three, four, or whatever, and maybe even like a website, podcast, something like that, that if they're saying, you know what, I really should know history more. I really, I feel like I don't know anything about church history. I really, you know, I, I just, I'm just at a loss, but what do I do? It's 2000 years <laughs> of history and, and it's a little overwhelming. Where should someone start? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I mean, I think there are probably a, well, there's any number of resources out there, books, obviously, as you indicated. Um, and um, in terms of, well, let me begin with books. Um, you know, I use a book by Timothy Dowley called The uh, Introduction to the History of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a very good textbook uh, in many ways. And uh, so it gives an overview of 2000 years. It's not just he, um, it's about 20 individuals different areas of specialty that they have. And then he's edited the whole seamlessly in many ways. So you feel like you're reading one author, even though you're reading 20 different authors. Mm. Um, there are podcasts, uh, Steve Nichols, who is the president of Reformation Bible College in uh, Orlando, very closely associated with Ligonier. Um, he has a, um, a podcast called Five Minutes in Church History. Just a five minute thing every day that you can listen to and uh, you'll get the, kind of a gems. Uh, he's a very good historian. Um, I myself have something uh, with one of my colleagues at Southern, Mike Pullman. Mike's, Mike did his PhD in church history, um, although he's, his expertise is in uh, Christian preaching. And we do a podcast together uh, once oh, cool. a week, um, usually airs on Tuesday and it's called Bead, um, History for the Church. Um, and Bede was a early English, Anglo-Saxon actually, uh, author um, who lived in the 700s and wrote a very famous book called um, The Ecclesiastical History of the English People. Mm. And uh, so we've taken that and kind of played a little bit. With it. So it's, the podcast is Bede, colon, History for the Church, not the history of the church, but history for the church. And we, we, do, we basically do church history. Um, nice. So this past week, we had one of our uh, colleagues, uh, Professor John Wilsey, as, as a guest, and we talked about Christian nationalism uh, in the United States in particular, but we also touched a little bit on Canada. Um, so there are those sorts of things. Um, we have a website, the Andrew Fuller website. Uh, Andrew Fuller Center for Baptist Studies is a website in which we, you know, have a variety of church history links, as well as stuff that I've written, or stuff that various fellows of the center have written. Um, so there's a fair amount out there uh, if you search for it. Yeah. And um, um, we, I think we, in some ways, we're, we're living in a bit of a golden age for church history. There's just a tremendous amount of resources, particularly for younger people, young, young children, which I, I know we did not have. And I would often have during the summers with my kids, uh, what we called history camp, mm. because there were they weren't getting this, these kind of rich resources in school. And uh, they actually didn't, they weren't, they didn't exist. Wow. And the last 25 years have seen just a, a plethora of resources made available. Wow. So there is stuff out there. Um, and I'd certainly be happy uh, to field questions from people. Uh, my email is mhaken, H-A-Y-K-I-N at sbts.edu. So mhaken at sbts.edu and, you know, the deal with, you know, if you're interested in pursuing further uh, studies in history, you know, uh, by yourself or with others, uh, yeah, just let me know. I'd be happy yeah, to yeah. answer questions. No, I appreciate you, uh, you offering that. That's, that's great. 
Um, what about Christian spirituality? Yeah, um, again, there are a fair amount of, I don't know about podcasts or websites per se, but there is a fair amount of written material. Um, uh, Don Whitney, who kind of heads up the spirituality section at Southern, um, he's written a number of very good books on, um, on Christian spirituality, uh, personal spiritual disciplines, uh, corporate spiritual disciplines. Uh, those are two books he's written. Um, Asa McGrath has written a history of Christian spirituality. Mm. Um, Richard Lovelace, The Dynamics of uh, Spiritual Life, just a tremendous book, combines history and spirituality. Um, I've written a small thing, The God Who Draws Near, which is kind of a primer mm. on biblical spirituality. And um, so I'm not sure, as I said, about websites, but there are, again, uh, a, a, a sizable amount uh, of a uh, sizable amount of good literature on Wonderful. Christian spirituality. Well, for our viewers, I'll put those links in the description so everybody can yeah, go find those pretty good. easily. Good. Um, did you want to add anything else before we before we wrap up and head out? No, I'm very thankful for this opportunity and yeah, no, me too. Yeah. And yeah, uh, every blessing wonderful. on this on the on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, again, um, thank you again for the time. I know My pleasure. we had some uh, technical difficulties before, and uh, glad we made this work. So. Uh, Thank you. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you later. Thanks. Thank you.